Okay, friends, very simply, the passage today is Moses at the burning bush, which is Exodus chapter 3, covering all the verses from 1 to 22. The call of a rather reluctant Moses to follow the call of God in his life. Now, I'm sure there are many times you've listened to someone teaching from the Bible, maybe a preacher or just study the Bible yourself, and you've noticed or heard that there's something that you really should do, and you've thought afterwards, I know I'm meant to do that, but that seems impossible. There's no way that I'm qualified to do that. I'm not able to do that. It simply won't work if God's asking me to do that thing. I wonder if you've ever felt that way. I know I certainly have. Maybe you're reading your Bible and you find something that God says very clearly you should do, and you thought, I'm just not the person who's qualified to do that. Well, if you felt that way, I would suspect most of us have at some point and probably all Christians do at some point in their journey. But the important thing that we all need to know and recognize is that we're not alone. No less than the mighty Moses himself was told to do something by God directly and that's exactly how he felt. In fact, he began to object to what the Lord told him to do. So what I want us to do today is look or begin to look at those objections that Moses raised. There are at least three, most people would actually say maybe five things that Moses, excuses, reasons, objections that Moses gave to the Lord as to why he wasn't the person that he wasn't equipped or adequately able to do what the Lord told him to do. And I'd like to look at them, but more importantly, I'd like us to look and see how God answered those objections of Moses and if they can help us. So with that in mind, turn with me. Well, I'm going to read for you Exodus chapter 3, which of course Exodus is the second book of the Bible, chapter 3. And let me begin by just reading the first three verses for a bit of background. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a burning bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then the Lord said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Now I'm going to pause right there, because there is a sense this is sitting as an introduction to the rest of the chapter. We should say that this is the background, the circumstances that are going to produce the rest of the chapter after this, which we'll look at obviously in a minute. But what I want to do is to begin to look at the circumstances that were being described here in these first three verses. What these three verses are telling us is that Moses, well, as you will recall, we now know from the first two chapters that he was originally born, raised in Egypt, but then as a young man, he killed an Egyptian and fled for his life. And he, went, he left Egypt and went to the land of Midian. There he met a man who's not named in chapter 2, interestingly, but now here in chapter 3, verse 1, is named as Jethro. And this Jethro has seven daughters. And, well, the bottom line of the story is it gets to the point where Moses marries one of his daughters. So at this point, Moses becomes the shepherd, so to speak, of Jethro's flock. And verse 1 simply is telling us that he's now leading the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, and he leads the flock into the desert and he comes to a place called Horeb, which is identified in the text and called the mountain of God. So all this is just about laying out the background or the setting before us, which in a sense will paint a background picture before I make a couple of observations, something I think we need to grasp hold of. Firstly, we need to remember that Moses was roughly 40 years old when he left Egypt. And we know from other passages of scriptures that it is going to be 40 years later. So at this point now, he's 80 years old. In total, he's going to live to be 120 before he dies, a good old age. But at this point, he's probably about 80 years old. And it tells us he comes to this place called Horeb, which is identified as the mountain of God, which is in fact is just another name for Mount Sinai. Now later he will go to Egypt and he'll deliver the children of Israel and return here to the Sinai Peninsula where he will go up this mountain of God where he will be given the Ten Commandments as well as other revelations about this, how this early Israelite society should be constituted and run. 
but at this point he doesn't know any of that. However, it is interesting to note that he's at the place which later he's going to come back to and which is called the mountain of God. And the reason it's called the mountain of God because at the point the text was written after the events, this was recognized as the place where God would give Moses the Ten Commandments. So yes, it's Mount Horeb, but yes, it is also Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Now that's the traditional explanation of what's going on here. There are more modern Bible teachers who disagree with that, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but I've kind of concluded that I think the traditional interpretation that this is the same site as where, where the Ten Commands were delivered is probably the right way to approach this. So anyway, that's where Moses is right now. And verse 2 tells us that an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Now again, I need to pause and ask the question, well, what does this mean? Who is this angel of the Lord? Is this a literal angel? Because sometimes in the Old Testament, when it uses the word angel, it's talking about an angel. And sometimes it uses this wider term, the angel of the Lord. And when it does that, it's usually talking about an appearance of the Lord himself in angelic form. And on this occasion, I believe it is the Lord himself. And those who have come to study this passage in detail come to it and by its use of language, many would identify this as not only the Lord himself, but the term used is one referring to God revealing himself, some would say as a full blown Christophany, but certainly the Lord God appearing in his salvation and redemptive form. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Now the verse is talking about the Lord, and you know this is a very famous story. According to these opening verses, what Moses saw was a bush, and a bush that was not burning. It wasn't burning up. Now you might say that's an odd, almost a miraculous fact. The bush is on fire, but not burning up. So this is way beyond just some bush spontaneously catching fire. The question becomes why appear in an ever-burning bush. So that's where we're up to. Moses is in the Sinai Peninsula, up a mountain or halfway up a mountain, and he encounters this burning bush, this flame within a burning bush. Now Moses encountering this burning bush, I would suggest is the first example in written recorded history of what modern day thinking would call the journey of self-discovery. And here it is seen through his encounter with God. The burning bush can be seen as a representation of a transformative encounter, symbolizing the transformation of one's inner self, his purpose and his identity through an encounter with the God who saves and redeems, the internal God who saves and redeems. It suggests to me that such a transformative experience can lead to a deeper connection, as it did with Moses, finding the deepest possible connection with God himself, something outside oneself, something greater than oneself. But importantly, by doing it, get an insight, a broader understanding of the events going on in the world at the time you're living in and the ability to respond to them with God's help. This story highlights the importance of recognizing and embracing the call of God in one's life, a call to meaning, a call to life's purpose, a call, in fact, to adventure. The symbolic intersection contained within the story of Moses and the burning bush, I think highlights the universal theme of self-discovery, personal growth, purpose and transformation. Those things and that thinking that is everywhere nowadays, but very much removed from a relationship with God. But here we have, I believe, demonstrated through this ancient narrative something that, yes, it can still resonate with modern psychological concepts and provide insight into the human experience, but the key involves in recognizing that this event truly occurs through an interaction with God himself. And here God appears in the burning bush. So let's pick up the passage again in verse 4. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, so God waited for Moses to turn his face towards him. 
It then says, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. So I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, and the Hevites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel have come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So that's Moses' commission. That's Moses' call to action. That's the command. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, and you are going to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now let's walk through this passage a little more slowly and closely. God first calls Moses and Moses says, here I am. Now that's an interesting expression. That sort of interaction has already occurred in scripture. As a matter of fact, Abraham said that when the Lord spoke to him. Joseph said that when the Lord spoke to him. And we will see later that Samuel and others will say that when the Lord speaks to them. So Moses replies, says, here I am. And the Lord says, take off your sandals. Now, removing your shoes was just simply a custom in that day that anyone who was of a lower status would take off their shoes when entering into the presence of someone of a superior status to show respect. So the removal of the sandals just symbolizes in the culture of that day a sign of deep respect. That's what's going on with that. God then identifies himself and says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And that's also significant. As you know, we very recently went through the book of Genesis and we saw God there make a covenant with Abraham and that covenant was to give him the land of Palestine and then we saw him renew that covenant with Isaac and renew it again with Jacob. So when God says to him, speaks to Moses and says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, he's meaning to say, it is I. It is I, the God, the one that made that covenant, that promise to those patriarchal fathers, a promise to give the land of Israel to the children of Israel. Now, we need to remember that there's been many years between the events at the end of Genesis and here these being described at the beginning of Exodus. The last time God had revealed himself to anyone at this point in time was 400 years ago, 400 years previously. So it's been 400 years since God revealed himself to anybody for any reason. So it really makes sense, doesn't it, that God would begin by identifying himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And having done that, he then says to Moses, I have seen the oppression of my people and I've heard their cry. I know their sorrow. And today I have come down to begin the process of delivering my people. But notice who he says is going to deliver them. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, if you know anything about the Bible or you've read it at all or had any interactions with it in childhood, you've probably heard the expression, the land of milk and honey. But I wondered, have you ever wondered what it actually meant, what it was meant to symbolize, what it was meant to mean to Moses and to those who would follow on. Well, think about it for a minute. Where do you get milk from? Well, today we would very much say a cow, but in scriptures at this point, milk mainly came from goats and sheep. Cows as well, yes, but the point being made here is that milk comes from animals. So that's one thing. So what about honey? What does that mean? Well, if you have honey, that's an indication that there's going to be pollinating plants there. So this little expression, milk and honey, is simply a way of describing that this promised land is going to be a place that is able to sustain both crops and herds, flocks and fruit, 
animals and vegetables. You see, in Egypt, they didn't get much rain. They did manage to rear crops, but only in the Nile Delta area. They were only able to grow crops roughly within half a kilometre of either side of the River Nile by irrigating the land and creating channels into farmlands where they could grow crops in that limited area. In Egypt, they had crops in the Nile Valley only, but in Palestine, it rained frequently and they could grow crops in many places throughout that land. So this expression, milk and honey, is just another way of saying, I'm taking you to a land that is going to be able to produce an abundance of crops and will support grazing animals and will sustain and enable the children of Israel to not only survive, but to thrive. And verse 10 is the key verse in this whole chapter when he says, Come now, therefore, so he's speaking to Moses, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, it seems to me that Moses doesn't really quite take this in, and that's evidence because immediately he starts objecting at this point, and we're going to look at that in a minute. However, let me remind you that we need to remember that Moses had good reason, perhaps, for worrying about this because, remember, he'd killed someone back in Egypt. What might happen if Moses went back to Egypt, he probably thought. Was he going to take his life in his hands? He didn't know whether he would be remembered or they'd forgotten about this. But the other thing I'd like to point out is this. Why did God choose to deliver the children of Egypt out of Egypt and why did he choose this guy to do it? Who did God choose to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt? And the answer is this guy, a murderer. A guy who, who 40 years earlier, thought he could overturn the rule of that land and probably deliver the children of Israel by his own means. To which he got the reply, who do you think you are? Who are you to rule over us? He tried, in a sense, to do it in that way and in the process simply killed an Egyptian. But now, many years later, God turns to him and says, you're now my man. But at this point, all we've seen so far, basically, is the commission of God. I mean, you can reduce this whole opening part of the chapter to verse 10. Yes, it opens by giving us the setting and the circumstances, but the whole rest of this is the call of God upon the life of Moses, the commission of Moses by God. But now we see the objection start, and Moses says, okay, I understand the commission, but I have a few concerns in this matter. As a matter of fact, As I said, he is going to have, I think, five concerns. Five concerns in this chapter and three more in the next. But you'll be glad to hear I'm only dealing with the ones in this chapter today. Look again at verse 11. He says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So here's his first objection, what we would today call imposter syndrome. Who am I to go to Pharaoh and who am I that I should be the one to bring the children out of Egypt? Now remember, when he was in Egypt and he was trying to do things by himself in in chapter 2, when these two Egyptians were fighting and he tried to stop them and break it up, one of them actually at that point said to him, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? But now here we have 40 years later Moses saying, Who am I to do such a thing? My word, he's learned humility, hasn't he? I have no authority, he says. I have no power. I have no right to stand before Pharaoh and say such things. And you know what? I think he's probably right. But after these 40 years in the desert, he's learned a little humility. And the time has come where he's now saying, who am I? So listen to what the Lord says to him in response. So the, the Lord said, I will be with you. And this shall be my sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. So God's answer is basically, don't worry about it, Moses, because I'm going to be with you in all of this. That's his answer. It's fine. You may feel inadequate, but that's immaterial because I'm going to be with you and I'm going to be the one that really does this. It's not an encouragement to us if we're struggling, feeling that we're not qualified. Moses, you see, is what we would today call self-conscious and what the Lord tries to do is make him God-conscious. 
So remember that when you're feeling self-conscious, when you're not feeling qualified, it means you've got your focus in the wrong place. For when it comes to obeying God's command, we just need to be God conscious. Forget about being self-conscious. All right, so that's Moses' first objection is, who am I? By what authority do I have the right to do any of these things? And God says, don't worry about that. I'm actually the one doing this. The text carries on in verse 13. Then Moses says to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, Say, I am whom I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me. So Moses has this other objection. We've got to remember and hold in context the facts that God hasn't spoken to Israel individually or collectively for 400 years. And he says Pharaoh is going to say, and the leaders of Israel back in the land of Egypt, they're all going to say, who's this God that you're speaking of in his name? By what authority are you doing this? How am I, Moses, going to demonstrate to them that I have the authority to do what is demanded of me? And the Lord says, well, when they ask, who sent you? What is the name of this God? Simply tell them, I am whom I am has sent you. My friends, this is an interesting verse, and it is, in fact, one of the most important verses in all of the Old Testament. Because in it, God gives his personal name, and his name is, I am whom I am. So we're probably hearing that today in the 21st century and thinking, well, what in the world does that mean? Well, we need to understand that in Hebrews, there are no vowels. In the original Hebrew text, there weren't vowels. And this reply is technically written as a four-letter word. There are no vowels. So the reality is we don't really know for sure exactly how to pronounce this in modern English. The original idea produced the term, the name of God is Jehovah which of course is fine, but then many have decided more recently it was actually pronounced Yahweh. So the current feeling among Bible experts today is it's Yahweh because the letters that are chosen phonetically represent today for us in English Y-H-V-H, Yahweh. But the important thing is it's the personal name of God and when you see it in the Bible, in English, that term if it's in a good translation of the Bible, will appear written in capital letters. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Lord in capital letters. That's the name of God. Now there's another Hebrew word pronounced Adonai. And when that's translated and that term is used of God, it's translated as capital L, little O, little R, little D. But when you see it in Your English Bible translated Lord, capital L-O-R-D, all the way through, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That means the personal name of God is being used, and it means I am who I am. It means God, by revealing his personal name, is saying, I am eternal, I exist eternally, I self-determinately exist, and I have always existed. So here we have God, by his personal but eternal name, everlasting name, identifying himself to Moses. The story continues in verse 15. God then said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say to them, The Lord God of your father, of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt, and I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt. So go tell them, he says, go to the leaders of Israel back in the land of Egypt and tell them that God has showed up again. And I'm that same God, the same God of their forefathers. It's me, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Go to those elders in Israel and say the Lord God of your fathers has appeared 
to me, to me, Moses, saying, I have seen what's going on here. I have seen what's been done to you in, in Egypt. And most importantly, I have heard your cry. You're crying out to me and I have come now to bring you out of your affliction. And at this point, he lists those 12 tribes of Israel again to ensure that this is a, a salvation and a redemption that's going to apply across every aspect in the whole nation of Israel. So the real answer God gives to Moses to his second objection is when he says, well, who shall I say has said us? Who shall I tell them? This is, he says, go to Egypt and tell them that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and tell it to Pharaoh as well that that's who's speaking and tell them that he has to let my people go so that they can worship me. And the implication is that they're not coming back. The fact that they're willing to do it in that place and that place of travel and transience means they're not coming back. It's a simple, straightforward message. He says, let us out of here. Let me recap. Moses' first objection was, who am I? And the second objection is, they're not going to listen to me. Who shall I say I'm speaking on behalf of? And God's response is, just do what I say you to do. And he says, trust me, I'll be with you. They'll listen to you and I'll see to it that they listen to you. So God is answering every objection that Moses can throw at the Lord as to why he cannot potentially obey these commands. But then the Lord adds this in verse 19 through 22. But I am sure that the king of Egypt, that's Pharaoh, will not let you go, not even by my mighty hand, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I'll do in their midst. And after all of that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be that when you go, that you shall not go empty handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, for articles of silver and gold and clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and you shall plunder the Egyptians. So God's saying here, he's going to use his mighty hands with signs and wonders. And we'll soon discover, of course, what he's, what he's referring is to these 10 plagues, which we'll look at later when we get to him. But what he's doing here by telling him about this in advance is he's pre-warning Moses that even when God lays out 10 plagues before Pharaoh, he's going to resist. So he shouldn't be discouraged by Pharaoh not accepting what he's saying. He shouldn't be discouraged that a Pharaoh doesn't appear to respond by, to what he says. So God says, Moses, just do, go and do what I tell you to do. I'm going to be with you and I'm going to give you a promise. Not only will I be with you, but I'm promising that you're going to be successful in doing, in the end, what I've sent you to do. Very successful, it would seem, by the fact that they're able to leave the land of Egypt with plunder. Okay, let's try and pull this all together. What's going on here from a narrative point of view is a relatively straightforward, yet yeah, an exciting story, full of drama, but a straightforward story nonetheless, about how God reveals himself to Moses and commissions him, but Moses objects, and he objects to be being, he actually objects to being obedient to what God's asked him to do, but his reason for objecting is he lacks confidence, uh, he lacks confidence that they even listen to him, and he thinks he has confidence in getting them to understand the authority through whom he spoke. And the Lord tells him that the, his authority was in the fact that he would be with him. And to answer the second objection, God gives him the insurance that says, don't worry about it. Even if they appear not to listen to you, I'm still with you. So I believe there are several kinds of lessons we can learn from this. But one of the greatest is simply that God gave Moses a command and Moses, after some hesitation, received it. So what do you and I need to know and do in order to obey the Lord's commands? Sometimes when it feels quite daunting, what we know God is in fact asking us to do. Well, what we need to do is that I would suggest boils down to just two things. Number one, you need to understand that you have God's presence with you when you do these things. God said to Moses, I will be with you. So number one, the first thing is you just need to understand that you will have God's presence. And number two, you need to believe in God's promises. All you have to do to obey the Lord 
is hold on to his presence and hold on to his promise and then just go and obey as best you can and then trust him, trust in him that he will do what he said to do. You know, when we come to the New Testament context, in the close of Matthew chapter 20, the Lord commissions us. He says to us, all his followers, we are to go into all the world and make disciples and preach the gospel and tell the people about me. And then those who respond by trusting me will be forgiven and given eternal life. And he tells us, I want you to baptize those people and I want you to teach them, disciple them. And that is called the Great Commission. That's our commission in this day and age. And that by nature means that every one of us is meant to be involved in some way or another. But do you know, do you remember how that commission, the New Testament commission to us as believers ends? It ends with the last verse in Matthew being, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So it's the same for us today. We're just to go and do it like Moses did and remember that he will be with us. That's the simple lesson that we need to learn. God will be with us at all times, no matter what he calls us to do. And John 15, 5 also reminds us that without him, we can do nothing. And that's surely the way Moses felt. And that's surely the way we feel sometimes too. When we look at situations like this today and think, I can't do that. I can't do what the Lord's calling me to do. We just need to remember what God told Moses and what the New Testament tells us in Philippians, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So let me try and just pull this all together and close. Here we have revealed to us the fact that the one who promises to never leave us or forsake us will be with us always. And he is the same one who will give us the power and the authority to do what he tells us to do. So that's your answer right there. You don't necessarily need to go to Bible college to get trained. We can do it because we are not qualified ourselves. And that's what's going on in this chapter. Moses said, I'm not qualified. And God says, Moses, you're not, but I am. And I'm going to be the one who qualifies you. God does not call the qualified. The reverse happens. He qualifies those he calls. When God tasks Moses with the responsibility of confronting Pharaoh, Moses, quite naturally one might say, expresses self-doubt and resistance. This reflects the damage of holding on to self-limiting beliefs, imposter syndrome people call it today, and also the fear of stepping into new roles or taking on the challenges of, that God presents us in our lives. This encounter emphasizes the process by which we can overcome obstacles and find our strength in the Lord, the strength to fulfill one's full potential through him. The reality of God appearing in the form of a burning bush represents the powerful symbol of the transformation of God through his revelation and through fire. Now we know fire often symbolizes purification and renewal, and change and Moses encounter with the burning bush can be seen as representing that for any of us the potential for us to undergo a personal encounter with the Lord that can lead to transformation leading to us to be able to let go of the old self-limiting feelings and embrace the new path that God has laid before us in the knowledge that he will be with us that's it folks you don't have to wait till you're qualified. You don't even have to think you're qualified. God has already called you to obey him, to serve him, and he qualifies the call by giving us the promise that his presence will be with us always. He will always equip and enable us to do what he wants us to do in life.